Roger A. Haltgren, R-O-G-E-R, -E the middle A was Aaron, double A-R-O-N, and Haltgren, H-U-L-T-G-R-E-N. Enough. Okay. That's it. Okay. Um, why don't you start by telling us how you uh, got to be part of the Manhattan Project at Hanford? Well, I, there's many avenues. Uh, I was born in 1920, and my mother was a, went to the University of Minnesota. She was a sorority woman there, and Dad uh, was had not been a, a educated person, but she and my father met and were married and started from that point. So uh, if you can go back to the 1920s, and if you're putting 20 years and 25 years onto that, you're right square in the middle of the World War. And that's where I sat. Uh, I actually, fortunately, I went to a smaller school, McAllister College, it's in St. Paul, outstandingly uh, accredited, like Carlton and some of the schools. and. At that time, I was in a chemistry, physics type major, but in the late, well, let's see, in the late third, no, late middle, late thirties, the World War was on, and they were going and needing pilots for the Air Force, and I guess you can appreciate the fact that most young people men were interested in flying, and I was. But what you could do at that time was at the University of Minnesota, you could uh, take, uh, get in the aeronautical engineering end of it, and they actually would sponsor the Air Force. Well, I got involved in that, but the war was coming along, and I can remember, and I won't say try to in <laughs> incorporate all the details, but I do remember coming back from Flying one afternoon, it was in Wold in uh, in the uh, Air Force. The airport was in Minneapolis, but came back to St. Paul, and I was had a note I, in my room in, in the men's dormitory, and it said, uh, "Roger Haltgren is would like to be seen by Dr. Shiflett. He was head of the chemistry department, and I didn't know what in the world was going to happen because I didn't think I was going to flunk out or anything." And I was, did pretty good. Anyway, I got there and into a room about this size, and it was full of people. And what it was, this Dr. Shiftlet was dealing with the Air Force, and at that time, they also had people that were in chemistry of the uh, for their support the uh, atomic energy business that was going on, and the it also. The head of the recruiting department was there. His name was Dr. Stiles. He was head of the DuPont Recruiting Company. He was after chemists, phys, not air, not pilots. And at that time, I guess I'll have to say that the chemical warfare over was more important than getting pilots at the time going. There were more chemists were available, but anyway. And that's how I got into the DuPont Company, uh, which was in, what, 42, 43, anyway. I was transferred to the Manhattan Project where the DuPont Company had, and I got into the munitions business at the Hanford Engineer Works. It was in Joliet, Illinois. DuPont had this huge plant, one of many throughout the whole United States. And that was in, I was there a couple of years. Next thing I knew, I was called in. It was being transferred out here to Hanford. And I arrived here on 4-4-44, about 6 o'clock in the morning in a windstorm. It was an unbelievable time. And in those days, security was right up to here. You couldn't. Uh, 
it, it was hard to imagine how you couldn't imagine. We were told, and I, I was personally told, now you watch what you're talking. When you kids get together and start talking, you want to be sure that what you're talking about is talkable and not something that's secret because actually as a chemist you got pretty close to what the atomic energy field was. And uh, But anyway, that was a little pre prelogue, I guess I would say, coming out here. And I actually, from my, when I was flying, it turned out that when I came out here, let's see, Dr. Parker, Herb Parker, was head of the health physics people out here. I don't know if that was the title at the time. And actually, uh, who else was the other one? But anyway, they were all searching for support people. And this one thing went back to needing airplane pilots. Well, <laughs> what happened was I had a private license working with the DuPont company way back with in the early days, but as it turned out, the Manhattan Project, which was what we're in today, or was, took precedence. And uh, I don't know, there's several people here today, in fact, I don't know if any of you know, uh, I went to school with Roger Rohrbacher, he was in, we were in class together, he was in in the same department, and uh, but anyway, we had a lot of things that transpired, and when you're in that age, uh, the world is just moving so rapidly, and security was just absolutely uh, you, uh, unbelievable. There were times, and you were not supposed to talk to anybody uh, outside of your you know, what you were doing. Well, then, of course, DuPont had the uh, Hanford plant, and they were, uh, one of the big things they had to do was making, uh, taking plutonium and making the products that could have be used in the atom bomb. And they knew that, and it was pretty easy for if you had a pretty good physics background and so forth, you could actually anticipate what was going on, and it it just became a very tight situation. This is probably in forty late forties and forty five and DuPont left the the Hanford plant, which is right here in nineteen forty five and into forty six and we were given an opportunity to they were going back east to some place, I don't recall, but at that time I had just gotten married and uh, my wife was a, a physical therapist out here and she and, uh, had worked on the plant. They were th did a lot of the blood work. So obviously we didn't move, <laughs> we stayed here. And those were the early days and it's amazing to go back and what you think actually happened. I'm actually, I'm going to work a little away from from the previous because the uh, we worked in tandem. I was in the operation end of it and uh, Ted was over in the laboratories. And it was interesting, very interesting. He's very, very knowledgeable, uh, wonderful. And it was just... Uh, one of those things, and I know that uh, it was so, it was an edu a further education on my part. And we've still stayed together, and I think he, I had the chance of coming out here with him today, and being, we came out yesterday. But getting back to the uh, Hanford plant and what went on here, I actually worked in the operating field where we had uh, shift crews like a tea plant, for example, which was the original uh, extraction plant here, a plutonium, for plutonium. At that time, we knew what we were going to be making. And I would say there was about shifts where 
15 to 20 people on them, and there's usually a, uh, a chemist who may have been on it or a, some engineer that could actually work with, just like we're working today, at points saying, where is it? This guy right here, he just talked to you earlier. If you had a problem, a technical problem, who would you call on? That's the first person to sit down and, and analyze it, if it was a safety aspect or something to that expect or respect. But actually, the Hanford uh, plant here at this time was... Well, it's, it, it, I've been sitting here thinking again as to how we went on. Uh, you're young, your life's ahead of you, how long is the war going to gas? We'd, I know we had a bridge club, that was very popular. And the wives played bridge, and the men got involved in bridge. It, uh, and we had, uh, but one of the other things that was very popular to me was golf. <laughs> and I, I've played golf all my life. And uh, sports, I got involved in football and uh, had a chance to have a cup of coffee with Green Bay years ago. That was when I was just going to go to work and coming out here before. And it was uh, one of those things. Uh, uh, so I, I'm deviating somewhat <laughs> away from history, but there are so many history cases around here where you can talk to people uh, that have had backgrounds that are uh, near but yet far enough away. We knew what was going on here all the time. The security was just so top. Okay, and I, we can't use that. You oh, can't yeah. touch the microphone, sir. Oh, it, excuse it me. Sounds like a bomb boy. <laughs> all right. Okay. I'll tell you what, let's, let's get specifically in the tea plant for a while. Yes. T yeah. Tell us about what it was like to, to operate tea plant and what you had okay. to do to operate tea plant. Well, as we all know, the first extraction plant, at the time the tea plant was actually being built so they could extract uh, plutonium, well, they knew how to make this atom bomb. It was done in, in the laboratory, and we had the chemists and physicists around here that actually could, could uh, take care of it. But getting back to the... To the uh, well, I'll say the flow sheet, and I think it's difficult to actually, we've changed the flow sheet around many times, and I know that uh, from the lab point of view, the samples that went over to the lab, and people like, uh, were in this thing so deep at the time as we needed enough material for the bombs, but I don't know how much was required. It was so secret that you couldn't really discuss it. But we were on the production line of it, and I know just, I remember many, many times, Steve, you and I discussed the merits of sitting down the labs and operations end of it, and uh, it actually uh, was enjoyable, but it was really down to earth and I know, uh, I just thinking about and living with a, a, a doctor or a chemist. Uh, we didn't dare talk to anybody except to ourselves. Is what it amounted to. Se uh, security, uh, I guess I'd have to say, it was uh, uno. It, it had to be. And it, uh, but the tea plant uh, started construction at, in what forty three, I guess. But early when we first came out, I know many times we would be out in the, in the areas in, on production when it actually started building or going down to Hanford. There was a... Did you see tea plant being built? Yes. Were you around when it was being built? Yes. What did it look like? What was it like? Watching it looked like a, your kid that's had a, a one of these uh, construction kits where you'd put a... A box together or something like that, and just to pose the uh, let's see 
but it was a, just a skeleton is what it amounted to. It looked like a long skeleton. And uh, as far as uh, the size, and uh, of course we were sitting down with the, uh, the laboratory people and uh, there was safety that was always uh, incorporated, how much and uh, exposure to personnel that was working for you. Uh, it was uh, how much, and the shielding of course was the density. Lead was obviously a very uh, paramount one and I, the cells you've seen, I'm sure these pictures, uh, the depth, the blocks being uh, three-step blocks shielding blocks and it's uh, so people could go in and actually work there but it was uh, well it's hard hard to explain we had to keep very extreme exposure uh, records of all our people everybody that would go in that canyon they had to sample the, the workers we had would go in and take a sample of for example uh, if the metal that was brought up here from the reactors and stored in one of our cells for well X month or to cool it off, it would be brought forward and it would be dissolved and moved further up the plant where it was sampled. And that sampling was taken in these uh, stainless with lead lined sample uh, supporting things. I don't know what the exposure limit was anymore, but I do know that that these uh, samples were so vital to what we were doing. Were, were people afraid back then? What was the attitude about, you know, with workers? Did they, did they realize the risks? Did they accept them? Or how, how did they feel about the risks? I would say originally uh, well, first of all, I think one of the things that I would have to, I, I was one that was so anxious if I went to work with any company, it had to be DuPont. Uh, and I think the DuPont company, even back in those days, they were so uh, uno on safety and everything they did. And DuPont today, uh, I won't say the stocks, but <laughs> the stocks are low and so forth. But DuPont, from a ke chemical point of view, I'm sure, and if, uh, if that's everybody sitting over here knows that they were number one, weren't they? Number one. Yeah, but talk about the workers. The workers. I'm getting around to them. That's why the workers were so, they were aware of the fact that they were, had a chance to work with the number one company. And uh, it was DuPont. It uh, they uh, well, it's you know when you when you get into a, a question asked like that, you start thinking about it and how far is far on this thing. There was uh, in those days, I don't think there was hardly another company that you had to think about that would actually. Uh, it wasn't a so the work is a race. Workers pretty much had that same attitude that the, the workers, did. yes, were, they were the ones in were. safety. DuPont, they want, and DuPont, I'm sure, uh, there was no question at all in the uh, world around us. The whole, DuPont was number one, and I think today that they're probably share that same uh, category. And the people that work for DuPont, I know I'm one, and I'm sure that I speak for. So many people, they just felt there was not necessarily an obligation, but it was uh, just an achievement. You know how proud you can be to be out here today in this plant. It's a, it's a, we ha helped on this war effort, and I think that you people that are here today certainly uh, can respect the fact that here was a company, and uh, just like. Uh, Yesterday and this morning we were over in the other building looking around and I <laughs> if it didn't bring back memory after memory after memory it was down through the operating gallery and it, one of the things that 
we probably didn't even talk about here was people. And when we first uh, came to around here, I did anyway, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting mostly scientific people. But one of the f person that I do remember is he's st sitting here in our group now. And that's uh, Steve over here. It, uh, I think that what, just like talking back and forth in this past week now, when we were asked uh, to come out here and this excursion with you people, to talk about the opportunity to work with people again. Now, we've not had the, possi or we've, the possibility was probably there, but we did not meet, but uh, working with the scientific people, and I'm talking, uh, well, let's say chemists at this time, uh, laboratory people, it was so important to the uh, world we were in at the time for uh, high explosives that were involved and safety was so paramount, everything. And I, every time you get in, involved with these people again, and I've just wanted to say it, and I mean it so firmly that uh, when you get involved in talking to these people, you always get back to the point of the safety end of it. And I think that's one of the things about DuPont. And the plant, I was uh, getting back to that, looking at the plant yesterday and again today, then the people that are working here at this present time, uh, safety is very, very paramount. And I'm sure that you've heard that, and I think it's, it's an absolute must. I don't know what the... Used to, one thing that I miss out here is an injury uh, board, injury frequency. That was usually pretty strong in plants there, where they're, uh, well, just like injuries. And it might be uh, keeping that down, and it keeps people, without even making a big issue out of it, they just glance at it and realize that we're doing fine. And How do you guys feel about when, when, the, when the bomb, because a lot of a lot of things were secret out here, but when the bomb came, you know, let me just move this light a little bit. When yeah. the bomb came about, all of a sudden everything that you guys had been doing was sort of revealed. How did you feel about that when, when the bomb was exploded? and you Because and, you, you finally knew what was going on, right? I think we celebrated. And I'm going to get back, uh, deviate a little bit here before I forget about it. The, there's a question came up that involves uh, a famous chemist, in, his name is uh, Enrico Fermi, and you've probably all heard of him, but he was out here in 19, late in 44, and I know in 45, and in and off, but on one of the things that came up when we were all working in the middle of this thing, and I was working with a metallurgical group in 300 area, and we were actually, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, uranium that's used and it's irradiated, and uh, it's uh, after it's put into a can and sealed off so it's hermetically tight, then you get these together and you can come up and come up with your chain, chain uh, exposures and the safety end of it and so forth, but that's just a, a very <laughs> low-keyed mention, but I want to mention one day I was working in 300 area in the 313 building and that was where they canned all of the uh, slugs, the uranium slugs that were about one and eighth inch by eight inches long and they were actually uh, canned into a aluminum jacket with a, uh, I would say, I'll have to ask, what was that, uh, there was a bonding agent between the metal and the, and the stainless, what was that? Alsi. Huh? Alsi. Alsi, aluminum silicon. Anyway, uh, we were doing that, this canning down the line, you'd get the slug, which was, uh, maybe eight inches long and inch one eighth inch wide and 
one day we were doing this, and I remember there were about four of us that worked in this line. It was as long as from here out to the hall, and there was a a pot of aluminum right here, and uh, silk. What was the other things in there, Steve? In that we dipped a, the slug in there, and it was in there a certain amount of time, and we moved down the line, and that ended up as a canned aluminum uh, slug is what it was called. And it was just this slug that was had been welded together and it was taken out. Well, anyway, that per same day, it, I didn't know about it, maybe other people did, but they had a very important visitor to come there. And it was this Enrico Fermi. Well, the, also the time was... Uh, what was it? Just the uh, latter part of June, because I and the supervisor that I can't think of his name right now, but he called us into his office and said, "Now you've been invited by Dr. Fermi to have Fourth uh, of July with us," and we didn't really know where it was going to be, but that same day. I don't know if you're familiar, we were got into cars and it was leaked out then. We went up to Mount Rainier in Lake Tipsu, which is just around the corner for those of you who have been up there. There's a lake. Is it a lake really? I don't know how it's small. But that's where the picnic was. And that's where Fermi, that was the, and he was talking just like we're talking here now. He was just, uh, you know, it's it's hard to explain how those things gravitate through you. And but uh, Fermi was the closest I've been to a, a person that was actually uh, tops in the field. I don't know if there's anybody that like it, but it was uh, you know when you're a young guy and so forth, and people uh, just like today uh, were. Talking here, Steve and I are, are a little older than you people by quite a bit. But what a pleasure it is to come out here and to uh, put this together in a different uh, sequence of what to do. But safety was so paramount in these big companies. And even today, I'm sure that, uh, in fact, uh, we've all keep literature with DuPont, but from safety end of it, it was it. Was it. Well, one more um, story. If you could just talk about how they built three plants and then General Gross said you don't need the fourth, and in fact they only needed two. Kind of an example of how well designed that process was. Well, I I've sat down, I listened to the one of the lectures on it, and I really, and after the meeting is over, I think uh, someone else may be a little more familiar on that. But I know about it from sitting. But I, uh, it was such a just uh, you go forward through uh, the fourth plant, which is a B plant, and then coming back <laughs> and just sort of uh, go backwards, you know.